Poštovani gledalci, dobrodošli u još jedno izdanje emisije Granice Istoka. Ja sam Harun Karčić. Izraelska okupacija palestinskih teritorija od 1967. godine i blokada pojasa gaze od 2007. godine spriječile su palestinski narod da vrši bilo kakvu kontrolu nad vlastitim resursima fosilnih goriva, uskraćujući im prijeko potrebne fiskalne i izvozne prihode. Ekonomski troškovi naneseni palestinskom narodu pod okupacijom dobro su dokumentovani. Stroga ograničenja kretanja ljudi i robe, oduzimanje i uništavanje imovine, gubitak zemlje, vode i drugih prirodnih resursa, fragmentirano domaće tržište i odvojenost od susjednih i međunarodnih tržišta. Međutim, dosad je palestinskom narodu bilo zabranjeno eksploatisanje rezerve nafte i plina u vlastitoj zemlji. U nastavku emisije analiziramo postojanje prirodnih resursa u pojasu gaze. Picture this. You live in a besieged territory under occupation. You're hungry. Soldiers at the border won't let anything in or out unless they're forced to, and that includes food. You also live under the constant threat of violence. Schools, hospitals, places many of us take for granted are underfunded or have been destroyed. Electricity and fuel are restricted by your closest neighbors. Often, there isn't any at all. And unless you have exactly the right documents, you can't hope to leave. Welcome to Gaza, before the war. Gaza on a good day. I'm Dery Navogeda. This is Pinchpoint, where politics and geography collide. Let's take a moment to imagine how Palestinians were feeling in the days leading up to the war. Actually, you don't have to imagine it. The research has been done. Just one week before Hamas launched its attack on Israel, Gallup wrapped up its poll of Palestinians in Gaza and the occupied West Bank. The interviews took place between July and September 2023. Here's what they found. Anger was already on the rise. The poll found that 44% percent of Palestinians in Gaza said they experienced a lot of anger the day before they were surveyed. These are levels not seen since 2018, when there were weekly protests demanding the right for Palestinians to return to the land they lost when Israel became a state. Over the decades, the protests have never really stopped. Protests against poverty, protests appealing for dignity, protests for freedom. Gallup also found that most Palestinians surveyed don't trust U.S. President Joe Biden to negotiate peace between Palestine and Israel. Actually, an incredible 8 in 10 Palestinians doubted there could ever be permanent peace between Israel and Palestine. As for living standards? Well, Gaza was never rich, but the recent poll suggests people were struggling to buy food. Before the war, people were getting by, but just barely, depending on handouts, aid, charity, but rarely able to rely on themselves. The ability to afford a place to live had also reached a crisis point, with a third of people in Gaza worried about finding a roof over their head. According to Gallup, two-thirds of people in Gaza could be classified as moderately or highly vulnerable. And to repeat, that was before the current war. The shocking thing is, very little is new here. The United Nations, no less, had been warning for years that Gaza could become unlivable by 2020. Half of the people in Gaza are 18 years old or younger. Before the war, hope for their futures had slumped. And faced by all the rubble of destroyed homes and failed peace initiatives, the older generations share in their pessimism. Only about a third of people in Gaza will remember these pictures. This handshake in 1993 on the lawn of the White House between the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, and Israel's Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin. A year later, they received Nobel Peace Prizes. Now fast forward to the day before October 7th, when Hamas broke out of Gaza and attacked Israel. Gaza gripped in a chokehold for decades. Human Rights Watch has described the territory as little more than an open-air prison. Because without Israel's say-so, no one can go in and no one can leave. Let's look at what's been going on. Gaza is bordered on the west by the Mediterranean Sea. 
To the south, there's Egypt, the rest surrounded by Israel. You can drive from top to bottom in less than an hour. 365 square kilometers surrounded by the sea or a barrier like this. For the people who live there, there were just two ways in, the same two ways out. To the south, the Rafah crossing into Egypt. To the north, the Erez crossing into Israel. Let's start here. Erez is a huge barn of a place, fortified and built to process 45,000 Palestinians a day to go from Gaza to jobs in Israel. Just getting from one side to the other is a 20-minute walk. People are scanned, bags are searched, and it's all monitored by Israelis behind blast-proof glass. Nothing gets in or out without them knowing about it. Rafah is run by Egypt, and only foreign nationals and dual citizens can usually get through here. Egypt sees Palestinians leaving Gaza as a potential security threat. And the Egyptian government is no friend of Hamas. Before the 2023 war, commercial trucks could enter Gaza through Rafah and aid through the nearby Israeli crossing at Karam Abu Salem. All that changed when the war started. As crises have come and gone, other crossings have been shut down, never to reopen. Long before the current war, Israel has used the crossings as taps they can turn on and off. Just to repeat, the Israelis want to know exactly what's going into Gaza. That's to the point that there have been claims Israel kept Palestinians there on a calorie-controlled diet. By limiting food supplies to the bare caloric minimum, the aim was was to put pressure on Hamas after it gained power in 2007. Israel has blockaded Gaza ever since. Here's the United Nations former humanitarian chief talking about it 13 years ago. We have called and continue to call, as the Secretary General has done very consistently um, in recent months, for the relaxation of this uh, blockade on Gaza and the entry of, um, of goods in a normal way um, to allow reconstruction and to allow the Gazans to live uh, something uh, more like a, a normal life rather than the existence which they have at the moment. The aim was once to build Gaza into a Palestinian state. An airport was built. Optimism, if not high, at least existed. Now Rabin and Arafat are long dead. The airport has been destroyed by Israeli forces and only pessimism poverty and desperation remain. The so-called Oslo Accords that Arafat and Rabin signed 30-odd years ago were supposed to be the dawn of a two-state solution. I'll get into that in another episode. Now, hope and permanent peace seems elusive and mistrust has grown. Gaza is besieged like never before. Gaza City has a harbor, but the Israelis have dictated that boats can only go so far. There's a fishing zone limit, and most fishers don't have the fuel to even get that far. Also, in this permitted space, there aren't enough fish to go around. And these people live on the Mediterranean. It all means that on the Israeli side of the border, people can expect to, on average, live to 83 years of age. In Gaza, people die 10 years younger. A 10-year difference for people separated by as many meters. Separated by two border crossings, condemned more than two million people to a life of misery. Izraelsko iskorištavanje palestinskih prirodnih resursa, uključujući naftu i prirodni gaz, nameće palestinskom narodu velike troškove koji eskaliraju kako okupacija traje. U nastavku analiziramo geostratešku važnost gaze na tromeđi Egipta, Izraela, Kipra i Turske. Israel's trying to become a player in the world of natural gas. And now, in the middle of its military onslaught on the Gaza Strip, Israel has issued more licenses to drill. Trouble is, the Palestinians say some of those licenses are for areas in Gaza's territorial waters. People have known there's gas off the coast of Gaza for 30-odd years. The former Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat described the discovery as a gift from God. But because of the Israeli occupation, they haven't been able to exploit it. So while Gaza City could look like this, it in fact looks like this. Gas rich, but in ruins. I'm Darina Bugeta. This is Pinchpoint, where politics and geography collide.
It was during the media fog that surrounds the war on Gaza that Israel decided to announce it had granted 12 new licenses for gas exploration. Six companies are involved, both Israeli and international. A consortium of three will be working in uncontested waters, what's known as Zone I. Another consortium will get to work in Zone G. But Palestinians say much of that area falls within their maritime borders under international law. It's easy to understand why the gas deals have attracted close to zero media attention. Since October 7th, the media have had to focus their energies on reporting on the deaths of tens of thousands of civilians in Gaza. We're going to need some maps to explain what's going on, plus a tiny bit of basic law. Under international law, a country can exclusively claim anything inside three nautical miles off its shoreline, about five and a half kilometers. Under the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, sovereignty extends to 12 nautical miles miles from shore. Other countries can sail here, but they can't conduct commercial activities like fishing or research, or carry out military activity. Then outside of that area comes what's called the Exclusive Economic Zone, the EEZ. That extends 200 nautical miles from the coast. This is how the Palestinians interpret their claim on territorial waters. And this is the document that the Palestinian Authority sent to the United Nations in 2019 to reinforce that claim. In it, they say they have exclusive rights under international law to fishing, mining, and drilling. But these are the facts on the sea. Israel restricts Palestinian fishing boats to this tiny triangle of water. And in the process, Israel has carved out a chunk of the EEZ that Palestinians claim as theirs. These are the zones Israel wants to drill in next. In addition to the licenses recently awarded in Zone G, Israel has previously issued tenders for Zones H and E. A legal center for the protection of Arab minority rights in Israel called Adala says 60% of Zone G alone falls inside the maritime border declared by the state of Palestine. On February the 5th, Adala wrote to the Israeli Energy Ministry to demand that the exploration licenses issued by Israel be cancelled. Adala's legal director, Suhad Bshara, says the situation at sea is a lot like what's going on with the building of illegal settlements in the occupied West Bank. Israel has been engaging in taking advantage of natural resources in the occupied territory. So Gaza is not a unique a case in this uh, regard, land resources are extensively used for the benefit of settlements and other natural resources, including water and so on. And the history is, is well known uh, to everyone, I think. So yes, there is a very clear uh, uh, history and ongoing policy of exploiting natural resources that belong to the Palestinian people. To be clear, we're talking about an area with a lot of gas. Take the Gaza marine field. It's legally under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority, something even Israel seems to recognize, but it has yet to be drilled because of the occupation. It's thought to hold 30 billion cubic meters of natural gas. That's much more than's needed to power the Palestinian territories, so they could make money selling it. Last July, Israel gave permission to develop Gaza Marine, but the current war means that's unlikely to happen anytime soon. But many are asking, why can Israel dictate whether Gaza Marine can be developed, let alone offer licenses in disputed waters? Here, of course, we get into the politics. Israel didn't sign the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, although international law suggests it should stick to it. But Israel refuses to recognize Palestine as a sovereign state, so it also refuses to recognize its claim to any waters. Rights groups like Adala and Al Haq say that in itself is illegal. Areas deemed as occupied are supposed to be protected. These are the people who came up with the rule back in 1899. It's enshrined in Article 55 of the Hague Regulations. Israel and its warships off the Gaza coast says something else entirely. And all the while, Palestinians fear their gas is already being diverted by Israel. Old wells drilled by Israel much closer to the coast, like Mary B and Noah, directly border Gaza's waters as seen on a modern map. 
but the geology that formed the gas fields millions of years ago doesn't follow borders. Drilling from NOAA, for example, might also have drained gas from Palestinian areas. The Center for Research on Multinational Corporations based in Amsterdam says that if that happens, it could be interpreted as an act of pillage in violation of international humanitarian and criminal law, which could also incur individual criminal liability. But in the context of the violence being inflicted on the people of Gaza, confidence that anything will be done is close to zero. Now we know for sure they can get away with everything, and literally everything. So, so there's no need to, um, to give the Palestinians anything within their territorial waters, at least from a political point of view. If you can starve children to death, then <laughs> there's like natural gas is way behind that. Either way, Israel has now pretty much drained both Mari B and Noah. It's now pumping gas from its other mega sites like Tamar and Leviathan. Israel's gas consumption and income have risen dramatically. In January, Israel's tax authority said levies collected from profits on gas and other natural resources rose to $1.75 billion in 2023. So where does it all go? Israel exports gas to Jordan and also to Egypt through a pipeline which lies in Palestinian waters, again, with no agreement. Israel is also planning a pipeline with Cyprus as Europe seeks to rid itself altogether of gas imports from Russia. Gas is also a major driver of Israel's sovereign wealth fund. Last September, the finance ministry said it had topped $1 billion. The Israeli government forecasts it will grow to as much as $12 billion in the next decade. Recently, a deal through indirect negotiations was made to divide up a gas field that falls in both Lebanese and Israeli territorial waters. Lebanon and Israel, two countries which are officially in a state of war but the Palestinians are still waiting, in poverty, watching as their gas concessions are bought and sold while the world watches them being killed, while the world watches Gaza being destroyed. Izraelska ograničenja kretanja ljudi i robe, uništavanje proizvodnih sredstava u čestim vojnim operacijama i zabrana uvoza ključnih tehnologija uništili su ekonomiju Gaze. Prije ovog sukoba, 80% stanovništva živjelo je od humanitarne pomoći, navedeno je u brojnim izvještajima UN-a, u kojem je isteknuta i prisilna zavisnost palestinske ekonomije od Izraela. Poštovani gledalci, bilo je to sve u ovom izdanju emisije Granice Istoka. Ako ste propustili bilo koji dio, emisiju možete pogledati na našem web portalu balkans.aljazira.net. Hvala na pažnji.